One of the things that gets me curious in, in hearing you talk about this is uh, the striations of the uh, clouds, the, especially in the clouds that were formed by contrails. Mm -hmm. They look like uh, herringbone, fishbone patterns and things like that. A lot of people think it's uh, the HARP program from Alaska, but perhaps it's a little bit more localized. Could That's you explain that? Is that uh, I mean, HARP, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful tool for uh, changing the charge uh, above a local storm. But I just I don't see how it can do all that it's being done. I'm speculating here. The portion of uh, intervention that these weapons play, HARP is probably sub 20 percent, and it may be sub 10 percent. That uh, everything else is is done with with other means. Well, largely through ELFs, extremely low frequency waves. Those are the base waves that all of the frequencies come from. That's your foundation. You can affect all cellular life with them. You can done properly, you can steer the weather, it's these very, very low frequency, these long wavelengths, and everything sprouts from those. It's interesting, because I got an email from uh, an Air Force guy who was actually in signaling an, an RF, and he said, you know, Scott, it, it, you're there, you're there, and um, it is the ELS, and he said, the best way around that is play classical music, and see how much of a difference it makes in your moods and attitudes, because we're subjected to these waves continuously. And you have to deploy countermeasures at home. So emotionally, you're not brought down to where they want you because largely what they're doing and the whole planet is blanket, blanketed with them, it's a stepping back of consciousness. And uh, the farther they can keep us, the more retarded they can keep us, uh, the happier they are because then that means we're not going to, uh, we're not going to question their rules. And that's really what it's all about, is us not questioning their rule. I think you're right on with that. And I find it interesting how there are so many people in the military that know this is going on, yet uh, I guess, you know, I understand some of the information is compartmentalized, et cetera, but um, their conscience enough. must be bothering them on some level that they have to, like, reach out to people like you and other sky watchers where, okay, you're close, you, uh, you know, that, don't you think that that could be happening? I agree. Absolutely, I agree. What I'm trying to do with, with my work here is create a cover so we can draw out some of these people in the know that are wrestling with their conscience. I know they're going to come, and, and once the dam breaks, it's going to be a flood, and there'll be nothing they could do to stop it. Then the people will know. And that's what I'm curious about, is how that aspect of this is going to play out. I've always known that they're not, they're not going to be able to keep this a secret forever, and they've known that. It's just too bloody obvious. I mean, look up. We've got trails all over the sky here in northern Colorado today, and it's all because we've got a storm inbound for tomorrow. And when we play in electromagnetics, you could be working for an agenda days down the way or immediately. Both are at work. And so st standing here under blue skies with the, with the horizon to horizon chemtrails, they're working on something not likely for right now, but for later tonight or for tomorrow. Just trying to, to figure out is, is it an. Well, the immediate effect is when we're under thunderstorms, I can hear them put these planes low and slow, flying, charging, discharging, and then measuring these daily thunderstorms. They are aware of everything. On the Friday night before we got the uh, tropical storm Hannah remnants here in New York City, I videotaped uh, for about an hour in the evening, and you could see the white trails, you could see dark trails, but you could also see the striations in the uh, sky, and the track of the storm was supposed to head about 30 to 40 miles west of New York City, uh -huh. and it ended up exactly the opposite, about 40 miles to the east, east. And, and way faster than they expected. Meteorology is still stuck in thermodynamics. And until we can get magnetic fields and electrical readings drawn, essentially measured, uh, every, uh, every five minutes is the data we get, uh, temperature, humidity, wind, and all, you know, that kind of, traditional data we get on a very regular basis. And if we could incorporate the electromagnetic effects of the atmosphere and draw that additional data stream into the models, into the forecast, into understanding uh, the climate system, we would be much, much better at now casting, at two- and three-day forecasts, at six- and seven-day forecasts, 
And I would think the climate change guys would, would, would be ecstatic because we, we could have a unifying field that extends into the oceans as well. I just think it would just change the whole paradigm of, of meteorology. and it, It's something that's got to be done. It's going to take an investment. There has been a greater effort in the last 30 years to reduce the amount of, of weather data we get. There was talk in the late, actually it was in the early 90s, about discontinuing the balloons, that uh, the radio saw balloons that the weather service offices around the country send up. Mm-hmm. They, they wanted to do it all with remote sensing from the satellites. And so they started running models without any of the balloon data put in, that direct sampling of the atmosphere, and they failed miserably. Mm. So the, the initialization of the models is, is a big thing. We need to have that accurate profile of the atmosphere of all its parameters, not just how warm it is and how moist it is. Has anybody been watching those shows on the Discovery Channel? Mm-hmm. And one of the ones that I watched last night is when they put these tubes, these pumps down to the bottom of the ocean to pump up uh, the cold water, which has, I guess, a better environment to, to grow the plankton. It's nutrient-rich. Yeah. A- and, and one of the purposes this, of this is to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. But I don't look at it as beneficial because plants need carbon dioxide with which to grow and flourish, especially plants that provide us with food and shelter and and, and shade, et cetera. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on this, this this type of geoengineering project. It could have a very negative effect. I think any money we spend on sequestering CO2 is, is wasted money. I mean, it, it can all be absorbed back into the planet. If we just quit using the atmosphere as a toilet, you know, if we quit burning the coal, if we quit burning our, our, our carbon-based fuels, if we can get off of that and on to renewable and sustainable and, and uh, free energy then the atmosphere, the, the environment will return to equilibrium very, very quickly. We, that's where our resources and our energies need to be spent, not in trying to sequester and, and stump out the carbon in the atmosphere. It's, it's, it's wasted money. The plants will take care of it. And as long as we can keep the plants watered, they'll continue to draw the CO2 out of the atmosphere. And they'll sequester it themselves within, within their biomass. And if it collects appropriately at the forest floor and so forth, then we can draw that CO2 out of the atmosphere, and it could probably be done in 50 years or less, and we don't have to spend a penny to, you know, to do it. We just have to get off of, of gasoline, off of petroleum. So the, the struggle is how the nation changed. How do you reduce the influence of the petrochemical industry from our, our, our policy decision process? That's really where our, our efforts need to be directed. I mean, we're not going to get any changes as long as we've got an oil man in the White House. That's obvious. I agree with that. Scott, you mentioned about electromagnetics sort of left out of meteorological science. Uh, I remember speaking with Gregory Benford at this geoengineering meeting Mm -hmm. prior. It was after this NASA Ames official meeting, and he said that it's a heat balance equation. That's all it is. Now, I know in your documentary and the work that you've done, you've actually revealed through experiments that electromagnetics and electrostatic bonds play a major role in weather systems. Well, well, they do. And if it was all about heat transfer, then as this planet continues to warm, as we see the poles continue to warm, then the term... Um, temperature contrast is called baroclinicity. That that baroclinic change, that change in temperature over a given distance, should be decreasing. If we have the poles in the summer, say 40 degrees Fahrenheit, now they're 55. The equator in the summer, 95. They're still 95 degrees. So we've reduced the change in temperature across the latitudes. That should mean that our storms are weaker. We get more rain. We have, essentially, what we'd have are larger high-pressure systems, slower-moving fronts, and as those fronts do lumber along, they should be producing more rain, but that's not at all what we're seeing. We're seeing an increase in the intensity of the small-scale events. And so that flies in the face of thermodynamics. I'm trying to get to somebody uh, down from NCAR to, to address this issue, and they won't. They won't go on camera and talk about it. 